Uh, Mayor Alex Penelas, thank you so much for joining us today on Jamaicans.com. How are you? Khalib, thank you. Thank you for having me. How are you doing? I am very well, and thank you for saying my name right the first time. I love it. <laughs> um, yeah, so let's jump right into it because you are uh, looking for a very prestigious position that you have had before. Now, you know how stressful it is to be um, a mayor, especially of a, you know, as large and as robust and diverse a county as Miami-Dade is. Uh, why is it that you decided to come out of politics and then re-enter politics at this time? Well, I'll, I'll start by saying that my wife thinks I'm insane. Okay, so, so <laughs> let's, let's start. Let's start there. But having said that, you know, I was. Um, I'll, first of all, thank you for having me this afternoon. It's a pleasure and an honor to be on with you, and uh, I'm so thankful for all those who are watching and listening this afternoon. Um, I was elected uh, to public service at a very young age. I, when I was first elected, I was 25 in the city of Hialeah and became mayor of the entire county when I was 34. And it was a remarkable experience. Um, and now I've been in the private sector for 16 years. And very simply put, uh, I seek to return to the mayor's office because I love Miami-Dade County. This is where I was born. Uh, this is where we are raising our family. This is where I have our business. And I want great things for Miami-Dade County. But there's one huge exception and one huge difference from when I uh, served before. Before, honestly, it was my career. My my entire professional effort was towards a career in politics. That's not the case anymore. I'm doing this because I want to serve. I'm not doing this because I have term limits and I have to run for the next job or I'm running for a pay raise or for the title. I'm doing this because I love Miami-Dade County. And unfortunately, I've seen that a lot of the important issues uh, that we face. We haven't gotten very far in the last 15 years. Affordable housing is a critical problem. We've made very little progress with our transportation, our public transportation. Uh, we've kicked the can down the road on issues like climate change uh, and sea rise, not to mention the response to COVID has been very disjointed, has been very inconsistent and confusing for the people of Miami-Dade County. So those are just some of the reasons why I seek to return to public service. Awesome. Uh, Bianca, I'm going to give you the next question. Okay, so you had just talked about affordable housing and how that's something that you're passionate about. If you were elected, how would you ensure that mass evictions don't occur in Miami-Dade after the moratorium in Florida uh, ends? Well, so you have a moratorium on evictions and you also have a moratorium on uh, foreclosures. Both need to be addressed, right? Uh, and now that I've been in the private sector, for as long as I have, I understand that there has to be relief on both sides of the ledger, okay? We, we have to give relief and provide support uh, to individuals who have lost their jobs and can't afford to pay rent, but we also have to support the landlords who have to pay their mortgages, they have to pay insurance, and they have to pay taxes to the local government. So there needs to be a very robust plan. I have, Bianca, a five-point plan um, uh, for COVID recovery. And pillar number three is based specifically on relief to small businesses, which would include a lot of the owners of these apartment complexes and affordable housing programs, and to displace workers. We have to address both issues. Um, one of the things I would do is by immediately jumpstarting our local economy with a local first program. It's something very similar to what I did after 9-11, after September 11th, where I uh, really pooled the immense purchasing power of our local governments and the public of Miami-Dade County to support local businesses first, restaurants, bars, uh, hotels, um, uh, you know, grocery stores, theaters. Uh, and that really got us, uh, at least in the midterm, through that hump until we were recovered after 9-11. So those are some of the things I would do very specifically. Obviously, recently, Black Lives Matter and defunding the police has been a really big topic of discussion. And the police budget is $116.9 million. And a lot of community activists and leaders have talked about reallocating funds away from the Miami-Dade police. What do you think of this? Do you support this or are you against this? So uh, absolutely, reform is necessary. Uh, I'm very much in favor of reform. When I was mayor previously, we had an independent panel. Uh, and I fully funded that panel and actually worked hard to give it more power, but I don't support defunding the police. And I just don't like 
you know, that you have to be on one side or the other. No, I think there are important social needs in this community that need to be addressed. For example, mental health, where, you know, our corrections department has become the largest provider of psychiatric care. You know, there's opportunities there to look at some things differently, but taking uh, funds away from our police, I don't support that because there's a lot to do. There's a lot of work that we need to do. There's a lot of unsolved crimes. We still have a huge gun violence problem. There's families out there who have had children, victims of gun violence who have not gotten their day in court. There's been no justice for those families. And we're gonna take money away from our police departments? No, I say that we need to uh, continue to support our police. We need to continue to give them the funding that they need to do their job, but not ignore the social needs that we have, like domestic violence, like homelessness, like mental health. Awesome. Um, and you have recently put out a, a hope and success plan for the black community. Um, now here on Jamaicans.com, our viewers are a cross section, both of people who are from the Jamaican diaspora, people on the island itself, and you know, people even outside of outside of that region, um, outside of um, the, the Jamaican community who are just, you know, lovers of our culture. We are very much about diversity and immigrants' rights and what have you. Can you talk first about your plans for hope and success in the black community and then about the immigrant community in Miami-Dade specifically? Of course. Listen, I um, uh, I recognize the fact that not all communities in a place like Miami-Dade County have been able to uh, prosper economically the same way. I am very blunt about that. I'm also very blunt about the fact that, you know, it pains me to say this, but racism exists. And it's a real problem and we can't run away from it. Um, so uh, my intent on becoming mayor again is not just to say what people want to hear, is to be very intentional about my work, very deliberate, and to set forth very bold plans to address issues. One of those is to address the uh, economic, social, and political disparities that do exist in our black, diver uh, diverse black communities, right? Mm -hmm. It starts with economic development. Um, you, uh, Khalib, you may or may not know that when I was mayor, we had race-based contracting. I was able to award contracts based on race, based on gender. Those days went away. The courts intervened. But now we have disparity studies that show true disparity uh, with the way the county contracts with co companies of color. We've got to go back to the day where we're allowed to award contracts uh, based on uh, local uh, gender uh, and minority status. Uh, that's number one. Number two, I will appoint a senior deputy mayor to oversee all issues dealing with uh, equality in Miami-Dade County to make sure that every department is clear in its role, not just to do its substantive work, but that it's, that it work be done in an inclusive way. That's so important. The other part of my plan for hope and success uh, deals with uh, health issues, uh, exasperated now by COVID. But we know that communities of color are more prone to underlying issues. Forget about COVID for a moment. Underlying issues of asthma, of diabetes, of, of, uh, of high blood pressure, which only adds to the concern if they were to get uh, the virus. And as a result, you see a higher incident of, um, of uh, illness and death among black communities in Miami-Dade County. So I've addressed that in my plan. I've addressed transportation and my commitment to bring rail all the way south and all the way north, which was part of my people's transportation plan uh, when I was mayor uh, uh, and, and the voters approved that actually in 2002. So it's a it's a very specific plan that, let me tell you how it would help our, our, our Jamaican and Caribbean uh, 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 neighbors because of its focus on small business. Mm -hmm. Okay, you have to, we have to understand that our economy is founded in small businesses and small businesses are hurting right now. They're hurting tremendously, okay? Uh, because of this, you know, close, open, close again. It's been very confusing, very, 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 uh, very uh, uh, difficult. Uh, so the access to working capital is critically important. Uh, tax relief and regulatory relief is important, but we also have to, uh, uh, like I said before, have this local first program and that would benefit low, low uh, um, small business uh, uh, businesses in Miami-Dade County of, of all origins, uh, right. Caribbean, Haitian, African-American, Hispanic. So I have a very specific plan. And, um, and, and at the end of the day, leaving, leaving the, the details aside for a moment, what I want to create is an environment where if you are a young black 
uh, girl or boy in this community, I want you to have hope that there's a place for you, that there's a place at the very top of our economic structures, of our political structures, of our social tr structures. I want you to grow up in a place where when, when the mayor is talking, there are, are people that look just like you right around him or her. So you say, wow, my, our mayor has a diverse staff. That's I the would, environment that I want to create in Miami-Dade County. And I want to ask you that question because you say on your website, I'm committed to ensuring the diversity of my campaign translate direct, translates directly to the diversity of my administration. You tout having achieved that when you were mayor before, that you had a nice diverse administration. Talk about that. Um, you know, you mentioned the importance of it, but talk more about what that looks I like. I had a very diverse staff, Emelina Alexis, uh, senior advisor from uh, Haitian American community. Um, I had, uh, you know, uh, my top policy advisors, uh, Erica McKinney, uh, Ari Lynn Turner, African-American women, the first ever uh, uh, female African-American director of our airport was Angela Gittins, the first ever black um, uh, police chief or black police director in Miami-Dade County was B Bobby Parker. I'm very proud of that. Um, I'm proud of the campaign staff I have now, which is super, super diverse. Right. Uh, and I'm proud of that and, and have that commitment going forward. A new Pinellas administration will be very diverse as it should be. Yes, yes. Um, I have two audience questions before I bring Bianca back in for okay. another one. Uh, from Sonia Diaz, she said she asks, I noticed this past week traffic has started to pick up again. It's only a matter of time before we're back in gridlock. How are you going to address the issues of mobility and connectivity in transit? Well, I'm proud to be the transit candidate. OK, I have the support of the Miami Riders Alliance. First of all, first of all Sonia, thank you for your question. I have the um, the support of the Miami Riders Alliance. They're, they're high, the highest score. Uh, of all the candidates they gave to me because of my transit friendly agenda. I have the support of uh, local uh, TWU local 291, which are the transit workers, uh, transit local 590, uh, because I've laid out a very clear plan for transportation. By the way, and it's not something that I just came up with now. That was part of my agenda when I served as mayor previously. Uh, when I laid out in 2002, a very uh, comprehensive long-term visionary plan for the development primarily of rail in Miami-Dade County, supplemented by buses and municipal programs. So uh, the first thing I would do is stop the misspending of the half penny sales tax, which voters approved in 2002, but unfortunately subsequent administrations have used that money to basically cover budget holes. So I would stop that misspending. Uh, number two, I would invest that money in a uh, rail on the South Dade corridor, which is so important. A lot of our Caribbean uh, brothers and sisters live in that corridor. Uh, I, I envision a one uh, seat ride all the way from Florida City to Government Center. I'd like to jumpstart the North Corridor with what could be now a likely partner in Broward because they, they recently passed their full penny. And then I'd go to the federal government on the uh, East West Corridor. So, um, uh, and I think that the, the cities, quite frankly, have done a good job with their portion of the half penny with the, the trolleys, which are free, uh, you know, scooters. There's a lot of first and last mile options, but uh, my focus, Sonia, will be on the, on the larger quarters, those 15, 20 mile quarters, people who live in Richmond Heights or live in, in, um, in, in South Dade who work in Miami Beach or they work downtown or people from Hialeah uh, who work uh, perhaps somewhere downtown. That's going to be my focus as mayor. Okay. And for those who don't know, these penny and half penny taxes are levied by the, the cities or the counties uh, to assist in paying for these uh, improvements in, in transportation. Am I, am I describing That's that correct? Correctly? But they were meant to support new projects, right? So new money, new projects. And what ended up happening was after I left, uh, they started using the new money to pay for the old deficits. And that's where things got really complicated. And the misspending has been uh, horrendous, over a billion and a half dollars. Some people will tell you, oh, that we overpromised. One thing has nothing to do with the other. First of all, no one overpromised. No one said that the half penny alone was going to cover all of that. The half penny was meant to be a local source of funding to draw down state and federal money. But number two, how does that give anybody the right to use the money? the wrong way. I mean, right. the money's been misspent grossly and I, I will work to correct that. 
Right. Awesome. Um, we have a question. I'm going to say this might be a little bit outside of the scope, but I'm going to ask it anyway, because of the fact that our Caribbean families are so um, interconnected, right? Even if you are not a Miami-Dade voter, you can influence Miami-Dade voters, I believe. So I'm going to ask this question from David Muir. He asks, does your reference to local first stretch beyond Dade County and out to the greater South Florida community? So, you know, in the past, we have had uh, what are called reciprocity agreements. Mm -hmm. So it has to really work both ways, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, in, in order to recognize exactly what you just said, that you may have um, uh, companies that want to do business in Dade County with Dade County employees, but they may be headquartered perhaps in Broward or Palm Beach. Uh, in many, in many uh, instances, we recognize those entities as local. If then Broward or Palm Beach have the same rules for our, you follow what I'm saying? Right. So right. A lot of it depends on those reciprocity rules, but it's right. certainly an option. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. And Bianca, let's bring you back in for your next question. So as you said before, gun violence is a big problem in the Miami-Dade community. So as distrust for the police grows, how will you bridge the gap between the police and the people? And how will you uh, work to, towards ending gun violence in your community? Right. So, um, you know, on the issue of distrust, I'm a big believer in community policing. I think we need to do a better job of actually recruiting uh, young men and women from certain neighborhoods. Uh, give them the proper training and then send them back to work in those very communities that they grew up in. I think that would go a long, long way in, in addressing a lot of these um, uh, mistrust issues that, I, that exist. Sensitivity training is another important piece of that. I think we've come a long way in Miami-Dade County in that regard. I've been gone for 16 years, but we've done, you know, based on what I've read, we've done a lot in that regard. Body cameras, I think, are a very uh, positive thing. I would also support something like a um, like a national registry to make sure that when we do recruit um, individuals who maybe didn't live here, that we understand clearly what their background and their history is, not just in the police space, but also in, you know, other things that they may have done, which may show certain predispositions. But I, I want to be very clear. I think the vast majority of our police are good, honest, decent people. They want the same thing we all do. They want to live in, in, in safe communities and they want to come home and they want to come home safely at night to be with their families, their their spouses and and their children. And that gets me to the issue of, of gun violence. It continues to be a major problem. Uh, it's a problem because, you know, it's 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 almost every day that you pick up the newspaper and in and, uh, and some uh, typically it's a young black uh, male. Uh, has become the victim of gun violence in some community here in Miami-Dade County. Uh, we should be ashamed of that. That should not be happening. Uh, so uh, my pledge is to work very closely with the latest technologies. I want to make sure there's new technologies out there that I've uh, that I've been um, made privy to that I think we could implement. Uh, I also believe we need to do a better job of uh, reinforcing our investigatory units. We need to bring these cases to justice because unfortunately people don't want to talk. So those folks who have committed these crimes are out there and they're committing the crimes again. And in the meantime, the families of those victims have not gotten justice. And then we don't provide them with any sort of support. Uh, there's no counseling. There's no there's no follow up. Uh, I've, I've had sessions with parents of uh, murdered children who, you know, it takes, you know, six months goes by and an investigator hasn't spoken to them. And then when someone does speak to them, it's someone new who has to be brought up, you know, uh, on the particulars of the case. So um, there's a lot that we need to do. When I was mayor last time, I invested substantial funds in programs like our robbery intervention details, our tactical narcotics teams, our anti-gang units. Uh, and we took thousands of guns off of our streets. Violent crime was down 44%. So I think there's, tar and this gets back to the, the, the funding issue. There's targeted things that we need to do. So we can't be saying on the one hand that we need to do more about gun safety and all these other issues. And at the, on, the, on, the, on the other hand, we're going to take money away from the police. Right. Um, and then there is the question of school and students. And I know COVID is the, is kind of top of mind for everybody with that, but uh, I want to look at another side of this. You say in the in the same hope and success plan for the black community, you say we'll you utilize the EAT, and I'm not quite sure what that is, but in, colla in collaboration with Miami-Dade Public Schools to provide financial literacy, 
job training and reemployment programs to the youth and residents in our underserved neighborhoods. I want to zoom in on something like financial literacy, which, you know, we hear about COVID, we hear about the job training and the reemployment and, you know, how well does, does any of that get implemented? But I have found personally, I, I don't have children, but I have found that there is a lack of financial literacy training across the board for all right. communities. And it is part of, I think, what leads to the great disparity and this ongoing disparity between white communities and communities of color. So can you talk more about that and, and those types of initiatives that are typically not uh, sure, paid so attention the, to? So the EAT is the Economic uh, Advocacy Trust, uh, which, is, which is mandated. Uh, to uh, help bring about economic development in our minority communities, our black community specifically. Um, and I address several issues that I think could help with financial literacy, even though remember, uh, the school system doesn't fall under the county's administration, that's a separate jurisdiction. But things, for example, um, like uh, uh, um, uh, internet access, we, we have, you know, we, we, we have, thousands, uh, if not hundreds of thousands of families that still in this age don't have access to internet. Right. And now we're living in this COVID world where we're expecting people to be able to perform from home to the extent they can, obviously, because not everybody can work from home, yet we don't have uh, uh, internet uh, access. That's one of the main uh, ways that I would work with the Economic Advisory Trust. Number two, targeted tax relief to small businesses. That's mm -hmm. critical. Access to capital. And not just public capital, because we hear all the time about these uh, $25 million loan program. That evaporates in two seconds. Mm -hmm. what, and what we're small, not getting it. Yeah. Small businesses need to develop relationships with the established private banking world. That mm -hmm. That's where the real resources are. Okay. Look what happened with the PPP. Mm -hmm. Okay. The PPP came out. And yes, if you had an established relationship with a bank, you probably got a loan pretty quickly. But if you didn't, you're out of luck and you're probably the ones that need it the most. So there's a lot that we need to do on financial um, literacy. Now, there's the there's the educational component, for example, of our middle and high schoolers to start teaching them the ins and outs of what it is to manage a budget, to live within your means, to leverage the inf the, uh, the the wages that you're making, uh, to properly prepare them to prepare a resume, right? To be able to present themselves to a potential employer. There's all so much that we need to do in that regard. I'm so proud, for example, of a dear friend of mine, Frederica Wilson. I'm sure uh, you know of her program, 5,000 Role Models. And that's exactly what she does, preparing these, you know, young black men and they're not, by a lot of Hispanic uh, men as well. And, 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 and she works with these kids when they're in middle school and gets them ready uh, to face uh, the real world challenges. They're getting scholarships to go to the best universities. They're getting trained. They're getting jobs. That's, those are the kind of programs we need to support. Awesome. Uh, Bianca, let me bring you back in and see if you have another question for Mayor Pinellas. Uh, yes, I have one last question. So as you were a Miami-Dade mayor before, what was your biggest accomplishment or what was the program that you put in that you were most proud of? So I'm not going to ask you for your age, although it pertains to this answer that I'm going to give, but, but but probably you may have benefited from it. And my pro, uh, and there were many accomplishments, but I think universal pre-kindergarten was probably the one that I'm most uh, proud of because... Although, like I said before, Bianca, education didn't fall directly within the scope of my responsibility. Um, I was uh, really made aware of the immense opportunity that I had as mayor to set forth an agenda for the youngest of our residents, for children. And in 1999, I declared it the year of the child. Uh, we had a, um, um, a a children's summit that was attended by then Governor Bush and um, you know school board members. We laid out a very clear agenda, uh, and and from that agenda we did three important things. We uh, expanded kid care, which was the health care coverage program for needy children. We created the the Miami Dade County Children's Trust, which has been a a, a huge success. And we passed a constitutional amendment that, that um, said that every child in the state of Florida would start school, not at the age of five in kindergarten, but at the age of four in pre-K. So 
as a result of that, Bianca, 2,026,000 uh, young people in the state of Florida have gone through universal pre-K. They've started their educational career one year earlier, and that makes a world of difference. I'm very proud of that accomplishment. My boys were already older, but now as time has passed to see my eight-year-old daughter, she's, she went through that program. And to see the difference that it makes in a young a uh, person's life in their in their mind and their in their development uh, to me that was probably the most important accomplishment mm -hmm. awesome. um i see i'm getting some private messages over here that that the people like vanilla so <laughs> um so good signs are having a great conversation um you you in your last run as mayor you authored legislation legislation for the creation of the homeless trust um Hopefully we won't see too much of that coming about again now, but obviously with COVID, people not being able to work, pay their rent, et cetera, it, it may become an issue even within our community. Um, how successful was your activity here the last time around and how will you advance this further uh, since the issue is coming back into the forefront? Kelly, that's a great question because actually I worked on that when I was a commissioner. It was even before I was mayor. And in 1992, we passed uh, landmark legislation in Dade County called the Homeless Trust. And it was a collaboration between the business community, uh, the service provider community, right? Organizations that had been in the business of helping homeless individuals with actual homeless people themselves. And we collaborated together um, and uh, it became with a dedicated funding source that became a model for the nation. We had a homeless population at the time documented of over 9,000 people primarily living in the downtown Miami area. Today, that population is a little over a thousand. So we still have a problem and the nature of the problem is a little bit different, which goes to your question, how can we change things? I think now because of affordability issues that people just can't afford to pay their, their housing expenses and the fact that we do have this mental health crisis, I think we need to, we need to, you know, uh, tinker a little bit with the um, uh, the emphasis and the focus of the homeless trust to work more on this mental health crisis that we have and the affordability issue. Before the um, before the pandemic, I had an, uh, an amazing visit to the uh, Camilla's house, which, mm -hmm. which which you're all familiar with, and I visited their day program, and I was shocked to see all these individuals coming in in the morning. They'd come in in the morning. And they 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 take a they they take a shower, change, have breakfast, and go back out. And I said, "What's going on here?" And they said, "Mayor, these are people that they have jobs, but they sleep in their cars because they can't afford to pay the rent. So they sleep in their cars. They they somewhere they they park their car somewhere here close to Camillus. They come in the morning just to freshen up, take a bath, eat breakfast, and go to work." That's the situation we're living in right now because of the affordability issues. Right. Oh, wow. I'll ask you a final question. What is the legacy when you when you finish a second term or another term? What is the legacy that you most want to be remembered for? I hope people remember me as someone who represented everybody. I want to be a mayor for all the people, not just Democrats or Republicans or liberals. And, you know, there's a lot right now, you know, who's more liberal, who's more conservative, who's more Republican or Democrat or Democrat. I, I, I was always a mayor for all the people. And I want to be, again, the mayor for all the people. I want folks to say he was fair. He was honest. He gave us a fair shot. This doesn't mean I'm always going to agree with you. And there's going to be a lot of decisions along the way that people are going to disagree with. But on every one of those, I hope people feel they got a fair shake. That's the most important thing that you could leave behind. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mayor Alex Panellas, for joining us today. Kelly, thank you.